All right, thank you again for joining us today. Uh, we are gonna be reviewing the prior authorization uh, process for uh, spinal neurostimulators in the outpatient hospital setting. My name is Rachel Wood, and I'm one of the nurse analysts with the Provider Outreach and Education team. I'm joined by uh, my coworkers, Mary Sue and Jennifer. They're gonna be also monitoring our chat today. And we do have a couple members of our medical review team on standby if any questions come in uh, throughout our presentation. As always with our webinars, if you do have a question, please send that into the chat and send that to all panelists. Uh, we'll go through these questions uh, depending on the time at the end of our webinar today. If we don't get to your question or we don't have an answer, we will follow up via email. So just keep that in mind. And then regarding materials, uh, these are available on our website, on our live events page. Uh, these are gonna be the slides that I will review today. So if you would like to go out and uh, download those, those are, those should be out there on, again, the live events page. Here we have our disclaimer. Uh, basically what our disclaimer says is that our education today is for informational purposes only. Medicare does change their rules uh, from time to time, so please make sure that you look at those official Medicare communications to stay, uh, you know, most up to date with the current rules and regulations. If anything comes out after we conclude our webinar today, that does take precedence. We are presenting on uh, the current guidelines, though, as I stand up right now. And then additionally, we are recording this and we will post this as an encore presentation. So uh, no recording or photographing our presentation for yourself. Again, we will be putting this out depending on the quality of our recording uh, on our YouTube page for you to take a look at or share with colleagues and so on if um, you would like to check it out after we conclude today. All right, so these are just a couple key acronyms. I use this as a reference for some of the things that we've used throughout our slide uh, deck this morning. Again, just a couple acronyms that um, are pretty commonly used in a lot of our presentations. All right, so that brings us to our plan um, and our agenda for our webinar. Uh, first, I'm gonna start by just providing a brief review of what the prior authorization process is. Uh, this will be for those that might be unfamiliar, maybe new uh, to the Medicare program. Then I'm gonna talk specifically about coverage requirements for neuro, uh, uh, neuro spin spinal neurostimulators. And then uh, we'll get into some documentation and some documentation examples, and then open it up for questions as uh, they come in. All right, uh, so starting with uh, just an overview of the prior authorization process. So uh, for those that are not familiar with this, uh, Medicare started a prior authorization for certain services included on their hospital outpatient department list um, on or after July 1st of 2020. Uh, this does depend on the service. Um, specifically, neurostimulators were added in 2021. And uh, for those that are not aware, the prior auth program is uh, a Medicare nationwide process and does have certain requirements for services, again, included on that outpatient hospital uh, list. So uh, the goal of this program is to ensure that Medicare beneficiaries continue to receive those medically necessary services, um, but those services are not being done uh, when they're not medically appropriate. So on the other end of that, it's also uh, has the goal of protecting the Medicare trust fund from unnecessary increases uh, in the volume of the services on this list. So uh, some basic things, uh, this does again include hospital outpatient department services only, so those that bill on the uh, 13X. Uh, this does not include services in ambulatory, ambulatory surgical centers um, or in the office setting. That is a question we do receive often. Um, and with that, uh, documentation is another thing I wanted to mention here. Uh, the prior auth program does not change any prior medical necessity documentation requirements uh, for spinal stimulators, uh, as well as the other services on the list. Instead, basically what the prior auth program does is just moves up 
when we uh, review and when our medical review nurses work, will review these cases uh, for beneficiaries. We did include a link to the full list of other services that we will not be addressing today. If you would like to just, you know, take a look at that or see if maybe you have some questions on uh, some other areas, uh, that link is there for your reference. All right, so really quick, I want to talk about our prior off request form. We did include a link to where this can be found on our website for WPSGHA. Uh, so this form is a cover sheet that you can add to medical records that are sent to uh, WPS for the prior authorization. And really this is used uh, to streamline the process and help us as reviewers clearly identify what the provider is asking for, so what's being requested, some of that key information as well, so the requester information, uh, how much, what specific service, and so on. It's uh, not something that we require, but uh, does, you know, help is something we suggest, and uh, you would submit this form as you would submit uh, with, along with the other documentation, uh, so you can do that through the provider portal, um, electronic, um, uh, the EFMD, and then the postal mail is an option as well as secure fax. So we do have more information on submitting uh, the prior author, uh, the prior auth form as well as documentation on our website. And we also did just do uh, webinars on submitting and the whole process related to that. So those are on our YouTube page as well if you would like to go out and watch those. Okay, so uh, really quick on some of the basics of prior authorization uh, before I get into final um, specifics on those neurostimulators. Uh, so determination letters and decision timelines are gonna be what I'll cover in the next two slides. So starting with determination letters, uh, these are gonna be sent to providers to show the status of your prior auth. So two, actually three options here. Uh, one would be affirmed, so basically the information that you sent in meets medical necessity, of, um, and on our review, we give you the green light, saying that if you were to put in everything you, you know, as, as it stands, it, it should meet the medical necessity requirements. Uh, the next would be a partially affirmed, so this could be, uh, probably wouldn't apply to the service we're talking about today, but for certain services, uh, you know, maybe we affirmed uh, one and not another, not multiple injections, but one injection. So you can have a partially affirmed uh, decision. And then finally, a non-affirmed request. So that non-affirmed would be that something is missing in maybe the medical documentation, if the person doesn't meet medical necessity requirements, um, et cetera. So these letters are going to be sent to providers uh, using the same method, method that they sent the original prior auth in. And um, they're going to be sent back to uh, you with what's called a unique tracking number, or UTN. And these are important because you do need to include these later to show proof that you went through the prior authorization process uh, when submitting the claim. So these are going to be valid uh, for 120 days. And again, should be included when you submit your claim or you submit a resubmission of that prior off. So say your case was not affirmed and you wanna send it back in with additional information, you can resubmit. Um, and then just a little aside on resubmissions, um, these are, again, something that can be sent in as many times as providers wish to receive that affirmed decision. Um, use that same UTN for the previously non-affirmed request, uh, but remember the resubmissions are not cases that you can appeal. Uh, that would come later on when the actual claim is submitted. So again, uh, resubmissions and non-affirmed requests, uh, these do not go through the appeal process. All right, uh, decision letters. So uh, these are going to be sent for initial submissions as well as resubmissions. And uh, for WPS, for that initial decision, uh, for the standard time frame, we have uh, 10 business days following the receipt of the initial request to get you a decision letter back. Uh, you also do have an option to ex uh, request an expedited review for up to two business days at the standard time frame. 
uh, for our, our initial, our, our standard time frame of 10 business days could seriously jeopardize uh, the life or health of a beneficiary. Expedited requests should have justification included in the documentation and should be very rare. Um, these are really only going to be, again, if it's a life-threatening situation, and for a lot of these services on this list, uh, that is not going to be something that we see often or frequently. So it's not a scheduling thing. It's not, uh, you know, the patient's calling you a lot. It's uh, a, a, life, a life and medical issue. All right. So that is just really quick on decision timelines. Um, typically, though, again, you're going to get your standard timeline, which is 10 business days. All right, and then the final uh, just basic piece of information I want to review regarding the prior authorization process before I get into our topic at hand is uh, prior authorization exemption. So providers may be uh, exempt and select uh, by Medicare if uh, they are, you know, demonstrating compliance with the Medicare coverage coding and payment rules. Um, we do include some information on our slide here on exemption. I'm not going to dive uh, too deep into it, but uh, just know that that is an option. There are some requirements that do apply uh, to become exempt, and typically exemptions remain effective for uh, 12 months um, or, you know, if, again, and can be um, stopped if Medicare elects to withdraw that exemption. So uh, more information is included um, on our website as well as the Medicare uh, operational guide for hospital outpatient department prior off. Uh, but I did just want to make people aware that that's, uh, you know, one of the basic things of the prior off program. Okay. All right. So, uh, talked about some basics of the, you know, prior off in general. So, decision timelines, determination letters, and just, you know, the list of uh, what is included. So, now I want to focus on uh, prior off for implanted spinal neurostimulators. Uh, again, these are performed in the outpatient department uh, setting. Prior off for this uh, has, uh, was for services that took effect on July 1st of 2021. So we are quite past that date. So we should, you know, be getting all services, um, you know, none of those backdated ones. But uh, again, just uh, July 1st of 2021. And this applies to uh, CPT code 63650. Uh, which is the implantation of spinal neurostimulator electrodes uh, accessed through the skin. So this code is going to be used for both the trial and the permanent insertions. And I'll talk more about that as we get um, further into our slides, but that is a, a common question that we receive from providers. We did include a link to the uh, NCD or National Coverage Determination, uh, which is NCD 16. 0 0.7 for electrical nerve stimulators. And this is what we are going to be basing our prior off reviews on. So I'll be talking about information that is included in this NCD throughout our slides, but if you want some more information on documentation requirements, uh, that is our reference for today. All right. So uh, first, just kind of a brief background information of some of the overview of the uh, general, general classifications of electrical nerve stimulators for chronic pain that the NCD addresses. Uh, this is more or less just for your information. And again, it is included in that NCD. So the NCD addresses uh, peripheral nerve stimulators as well as central nervous uh, system stimulators. And these stimulators are gonna have four parts. So part one is uh, the generator. So what this does, it's a Temporary spinal neurostimulator uh, It does not include the implantation of the generator, uh, but the permanent one, uh, so, so that would be the trial, that, does, that would not be uh, including the implantation of a generator. A permanent uh, placement, though, would include the implantation of a generator. So some of the differences uh, between those two. Uh, the second part is the electrical leads, and so these are the wires that are connected to that generator. Um, and then we have the remote control and then battery charger. So those are the four main parts that are, uh, you know, included in these uh, uh, 
uh, I guess the word would be uh, pieces of equipment and um, what you might be, you know, dealing with if you're, if you're uh, working with patients that have these. All right, so on to coverage criteria. Uh, so the prior out process, again, does not change the coverage criteria or documentation requirements. Uh, simply what it does, it just changes when we're going to be looking at them at WPS. So uh, we look at them sooner in the review process, so before the procedure is done and before that claim is submitted. Uh, so first thing with coverage criteria, um, so the implantation of the simulator is going to be used as a, I think it says late resort, this should be last resort uh, for patients with chronic intractable pain. Uh, so in the documentation section, I'll talk a little bit more about, uh, you know, some of the evidence that we're looking for, for from providers, uh, you know, to support that other treatment options have, uh, you know, either been tried and failed or for some reason they're contraindicated uh, for that specific patient. And uh, treatment options could include, um, you know, medication interventions, uh, surgery, or psychological therapies. All right, uh, so continuing with more coverage criteria. Uh, so care must be provided, again, per that NCD's uh, instructions by a multidisciplinary team. So uh, this team would perform a careful screening, evaluation, as well as diagnosis of the patient's specific issues prior to that implantation. Uh, so this includes a psychological and physical eval and we will be looking for documentation to support that these interventions have occurred. Uh, additionally, uh, another coverage criteria is that patients must show uh, pain relief following a trial of the spinal implantation to move forward with a permanent insertion. And I'm going to go into a little bit more about the trial versus permanent uh, in our next couple of slides. Okay, so starting with the trial insertion. Uh, so the goal of the trial insertion is to determine if a spinal cord stimulator, again, is gonna be effective to relieve that specific beneficiary's pain. Uh, a difference between trial and permanent is, uh, again, as I mentioned, that the generator for the spinal stimulator uh, is gonna remain external for that trial and um, that's not the case for the permanent. So the permanent, that is gonna be something that is placed um, internally to the, uh, for the patient. Trial insertions do require a prior, <laughs> excuse me, do require a prior off um, and are gonna use that CPT code 63650. When you send in the uh, documentation, please indicate on the prior off form or somewhere in the notes that you are requesting a trial for uh, this beneficiary. All right, so that brings us to the permanent insertion. So uh, with permanent insertions, the electrical leads are gonna be advanced uh, into that epidural space at the specific level. So that is uh, determined by the provider. Uh, these are done after a successful trial placement has occurred. Uh, so some common things that we, question we get is that, you know, are there difference in coding? So permanent insertions are also billed with that CPT code 63650, so just like that trial. Again, uh, this is why it's important to indicate somewhere in your documentation uh, what you're doing, um, you know, ideally on that prior off form, so we know, uh, you know, what's going on. All right, so, um, want to talk about permanent insertions of multiple leads and we did receive a few pre-submitted questions uh, you know regarding how to go about this um, you know billing for permanent insertions that involve multiple leads so uh, if placing two leads we listed the steps uh, to follow on the slide so first you're going to bill cpt six uh, 3650, and again, this is following that prior off. So this was really more or less um, information on that claim, uh, you know, when you're actually submitting, assuming that you got the affirmed status and so on. 
Um, but so bill for that first one was a uh, 63650. Um, and then for the following, the second lien, use modifier 59 uh, for that, as well as for each additional lead placement. Uh, we do have some information on our website, on our medical review page, in the, higher, uh, uh, the uh, prior office section that talks about this in more depth uh, with implanted spinal neurostimulators. Uh, so just wanted to briefly, you know, mention that here. And uh, some of the things that we do not uh, recommend is using modifier 50 or the RT or LT for billing for these claims. So these are some common mistakes that we see providers make. All right, and then uh, before I get into our documentation and our examples, I want to talk about replacement simulators. Um, so how to handle these is a common provider question that uh, we got as well in our pre-submitted questions. Uh, so providers most commonly will replace a generator when the battery wears out um, on that current one that's placed. So the replacement of the generator does not require uh, uh, removal or replacement of electrical leads. Uh, for the new percutaneous per lead, uh, use CPT 3650 if uh, you are replacing that at a different spinal level. So again, we did include some information on this. This is also found uh, on our website uh, for your reference. Okay, uh, so moving into documentation requirements uh, for uh, supporting the prior auth of an implanted spinal neurostimulator. So we touched on a lot of this with our coverage um, criteria, but these are some of the specific things our nurse reviewers are going to be looking at for these um, prior auth requests. So um, we're going to start with the documentation of if it, uh, if it is a trial or a permanent placement. Uh, so then that's what could be one of the first things our nurses are looking for. Uh, then they're going to be reviewing for any previous therapies that this person may have had before uh, going to this type of intervention. Uh, so with the therapies, they'll be uh, looking for evidence of previously tried and failed uh, therapies that, you know, might be documented by uh, any practitioner that has the knowledge of the patient's health. So this could be, um, uh, a different provider than the one that's performing the procedure, uh, but we do look for support and documentation um, if it's not from the uh, practitioners performing the procedure, uh, we would want to see additional notes and the um, other providers notes submitted, uh, you know, showing that the requesting provider has reviewed this patient's medical history and any other uh, pertinent medical events that led up to the trial uh, with that patient. So documentation should include evidence that the provider, again, has reviewed that person's medical history and that the patient's medical history was included in the decision-making process to proceed with the implanted spinal neurostimulator procedure. Uh, supporting notes and supporting coverage uh, would be something that, uh, you know, could include mental health documentation. Uh, psychiatric eval notes, um, or again, as I said, documentation of any prior therapies that we have, you know, examples listed on our slide here. So surgery, medication, pain injections, so on. So moving on to documentation of a psychological evaluation. So this is something that uh, we will be looking for. Uh, this can be completed by a psychiatrist, a clinical psychologist, or a social worker. And the information that we would want to see with this is that, uh, you know, there's a statement that shows that there's no, uh, you know, mental health or psychological barriers to this person receiving the trial. Uh, there is evidence that the patient understands the procedure that they are receiving. Uh, they can co uh, cooperate during the procedure and the patient has a reasonable expectation of that trial outcome. And then finally, uh, we would be looking for a statement that uh, demonstrates the person's a good candidate uh, for this procedure and that there's no other psychiatric treatments that could otherwise have been done uh, prior to proceeding with this insertion. So again, you know, that last resort. 
All right, so, and this brings us to the last uh, slide on documentation before I'll talk about our examples. Uh, so for permanent placements, um, there should be evidence in the documentation that shows a effective trial. So this should assess the patient's response to that initial trial. And some of the things we're looking for here is evidence of the trial success uh, can be documented, you know, in various formats, but, um, you know, as pain is a subjectively measured clinical, um, you know, clinical thing. But um, so the way you're going to document and show it is going to vary, but uh, we will be evaluating for a 50% or greater reduction of pain. Um, so 50% reduction may be need for a pain relief medication, or maybe there's a meaningful improvement in the patient's, uh, you know, activity level. Uh, there, again, not one uh, specifically determined thing that we'd be looking for to show pain reduced, uh, pain has reduced, but something that, you know, you measured before and after to show that 50% reduction. Uh, so the length, uh, one final thing with this, the length of the trial is going to be left up to the provider's discretion. And at this time, there's no length uh, of time that, uh, you know, Medicare does define. So that, again, is left up to the provider's discretion. All right, so on to example one. And I have uh, three examples that we'll hopefully have time to get through. I think we should. Uh, so starting with example one, uh, this is regarding the trial and uh, permanent insertion that the provider is going to be performing in the hospital outpatient department. Um, so again, these are going to require a prior off. So for example one, this uh, facility is requesting the permanent placement only. And uh, based on what we have on our slide here, the trial insertion was completed in the office setting. Um, but again, that permanent insertion is going to be done in the outpatient setting. So in this case, uh, for example, one, the prior off would be required for the permanent insertion only, since it is the only one that is completed in the hospital outpatient department. Uh, for this, the trial was done in the office setting. Uh, so for that reason, it does not require a prior authorization. So again, only services that are done in that um, you know, outpatient department setting need to go through the prior off process. All right, so on to example two. Uh, so in this example, the provider is requesting a prior off for both the trial and the permanent insertion that are gonna be done at the same facility. So it's not listed here and it is a little bit blurry, I see uh, blown up, but uh, we are assuming with this uh, request that they're both being done in the hospital outpatient department. So if the provider is going to be performing both the trial and permanent insertion in the outpatient setting, only one prior authorization is needed. Um, so if that is approved, the provider then will receive a unique tracking number or UTN, as I uh, you know, previously talked about. That is going to be valid for both the trial and the permanent insertion. That UTN is valid for 120 days uh, from the date of the affirmation. Uh, so in example two, uh, you know, the uh, outpatient hospital uh, is going to be, again, completing both that trial and permanent placement. Uh, the facility is going to be billing with CPT 63650, again, for both the trial and permanent placement. Um, this is what you're going to be using when the CPT code when requesting that prior off. Um, and that is, uh, you know, what you're going to also see the facility listed in our example um, in that, you know, additional information section that, again, they're looking for both, both placements uh, and they're going to be done at the same facility. Uh, you know, on the other hand, that would apply in this situation, um, but on the other, one thing to note here is that uh, the facility does not need to submit a prior auth between the trial and the permanent placement, again, if it's done at the same facility. So if you receive the approval for the trial, uh, you don't need to resubmit for that permanent placement. 
Um, but, you know, they would be separate. Uh, claims might be different down the road, and I don't want to speak to that, but regarding the prior authorization piece of it, uh, gaining approval for the trial, uh, the facility is also automatically approved for that permanent placement um, in this scenario if um, done within that 120 days. And then moving to example three. Uh, so for example three, the trial and permanent insertion that the provider is gonna be performing. Um, one thing to highlight with this, again, if it's done in a different setting than the outpatient department, a prior auth is not required. So on our slide here, if the provider is gonna be doing the trial insertion in the office setting, a um, prior auth is not required, um, but again, um, so for this example, and let me just get my, my wording straight so I'm not confusing you, if the provider is gonna be performing this trial in the office setting, uh, and then the permanent placement in the outpatient setting, a prior auth would only be required for that permanent insertion. Uh, so this example, uh, look, we are talking about in example three, the request is for the trial only. The permanent placement is gonna be done at a different facility. So in this example, um, the trial is gonna be done in the outpatient department set, so that does require prior auth. Uh, for the permanent insertion, this is done either at a different setting or maybe in the office setting. So that facility does not need to request the prior auth for it. So it would be up to either the different outpatient facility that is providing it or the office. Uh, well, the office wouldn't need to, wouldn't need to uh, put a prior auth in, but if it's not done at that facility, you do not need to put in a prior auth request for it. All right, so um, that concludes our examples. And then I did, I feel like I've said this a lot, um, but I did already mention if it's done in an ambulatory surgery center, prior authorization is not uh, required. All right, so that brings us to our common questions and couple two questions I wanted to address that were asked uh, prior to our presentation today um, before we open it up to questions in the chat. So our first question is, uh, which procedures require a prior authorization and what happens if the prior auth is for a similar code, but a slightly different procedure ends up being performed? So a slightly different CPT code is done. So regarding uh, neurostimulators, the only one that is listed on the prior authorization list is CPT 63650, and that applies to that trial and permanent insertion. So if the prior auth is for um, um, CPT 63650, but the provider actually ends up doing something different, you are gonna to wanna, to, and you end up billing for the procedure that is done that is different. Assuming it's not on the prior authorization list, um, it is not something that requires a prior authorization. Now say, uh, you wanna be careful because there is a lot of codes listed on that for you know different types of pain injections and so on. Uh, if it is on that list, it does need prior authorization. But if it is a, not a CPT code on the Medicare prior auth list, then um, you would just submit the claim and not go through this process. Uh, so hopefully that is, you know, it makes sense. Uh, so then our next question is uh, that we received is, do you think paddle implantation will be placed uh, back on the prior auth list? Um, so at this time, we don't have any knowledge of any changes or, you know, any plans that Medicare has to update uh, their code list and, um, uh, specifically for neurostimulators, we don't have any, uh, you know, information that there are going to be any changes uh, related to that. If there is anything done, uh, stay tuned to our, you know, e-news, our webinars, and so on. We will definitely provide, you know, updates and education, but at this time, uh, there is no known updates or, you know, additions that we know of coming back to that prior off list. All right, uh, so this, we included a couple of resources just to the portal. 
Uh, this is a, where a lot of documentation can be added to, um, and you can submit your prior off. So we wanted to just include uh, within our slides, uh, you know, information and a link to the portal guide. Uh, if you needed, had any questions, these are really helpful. All right, uh, so with that, I am gonna uh, check and see, we have a few minutes left to see if we have any questions that uh, we have not answered yet into the, uh, that came in through the chat. Uh, hi, Rachel, we did receive one question. Um, is the prior auth required for the replacement of a percutaneous lead? All right, so let me go back up. And my understanding is that, um, yes, if the if there is a new uh, percutaneous lead uh, added in, and especially if it's done at a different final level, that a prior off would be uh, something that we would be looking for. And that's our only question we have in the chat for right now. Okay, awesome. Yeah, and if you do have any other questions, um, I'll go through our last couple of slides. And if uh, you know you think of anything, uh, please put that in and I'll check in before we close our webinar today. So yeah, not seeing any questions. So I am gonna um, conclude our webinar for today. Uh, so behalf, on behalf of Provider Outreach, we uh, wanna thank you for joining us and for your participation. And we look forward to getting your feedback in those survey comments and having you join us for future WPS events. You may now disconnect.